Good morning, church family. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about surrender, specifically surrendering our questions of why. Why would God do that? Why did this happen to me? Have you ever found yourself asking God the why questions? I certainly have. I've asked that question of God and I have screamed that question at God. And I know I'm not alone. As a church and as a world right now, many of us are questioning why. And it's hard to feel confident that God is good when the circumstances in our life don't feel good at all. We often think, if I could just understand why, then somehow life would make so much more sense, especially where, when we're in our valleys. You know, the disciples asked why too. In John 9, verse 2, when the disciples encountered a, blind, a man who had been blind from birth, they asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They were looking for someone to blame for the man's blindness. If only they could understand the why, the fact that he was blind and had been all his life would then somehow be more tolerable, more reasonable. The reason that man was blind was so that others could see the amazing healing power of Christ. Healing his physical blindness would lead others to spiritual sight, to faith. And the, rest, the restoration of his sight would shine the light on Jesus, who is the light of the world. But when we look at that from our human perspective, we think, but but that's not fair. That man had to go through life blind just so Jesus could make a statement. I want to know why it had to be that way. Couldn't he have found a better way? And that makes me pause. What do I want more? To understand the answers to all of my questions? Or do I want Jesus? As much as I do want the answers for the hurts that plague me and the rest of the world, what we find is that we, what we want and need more is that spiritual sight. We need to be able to approach a situation that might look hopeless and see that spiritual potential. We need to have that faith to cling to so much more than we need answers. We need to be able to rely on Christ, secure in the knowledge that if even if we don't understand why, he does. Let's be careful not to get stuck in the whys. Let's not allow them to overshadow him and to leave us blind to his presence, to his goodness, to his almighty power, and to the hope we have in him. And I know this is not an easy task, trust me. I have had situations where I have begged God to give me the answers, but I'm realizing that instead of answers, he's given me himself, a way to come straight to him, the one who already has it all figured out and can see far, far, far beyond the current situation and into the good that he's already planned to make out of it. Remember, you don't have to have his answers to be able to enjoy his comfort. Let's pray for a moment. Father God, I may not have all the answers to my struggles, but I'm seeing more hope than ever. Jesus is my light. And because of him, even my darkest of nights aren't so daunting, they aren't so dark, and they aren't so confusing. Thank you for reminding me that this day holds your presence your blessings, and your comfort. Give me eyes to see you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. I'm Carolyn Minnelli, an elder at Innisfit Baptist Church, and I'm going to be doing the congregational prayer. Just so you know, I'm going to read part of the prayer because I don't quite trust myself to remember everything that I wanted to say in the prayer. Um, and I don't know about you during this pandemic, I have sometimes found it difficult to find the words uh, to say when I'm praying, to even know how to approach God or feel like I can approach God. And I was encouraged by this passage from Romans chapter 8 a couple of weeks ago. So I'm going to read that and then I'm going to go into a prayer. And some of the words in my prayer are from Psalm 51. So that's a prayer that you might be able to go back to and use if you're also struggling to find words um, sometimes to approach God. So from Romans chapter 8, verse 26 to 28, the message reads this way. Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside us, helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves. He knows our condition and keeps us present before God. So even when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit does. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I come before you just as David did many years ago and how he wrote in the Psalms that he comes humbly. So Father, I come humbly asking your forgiveness for sin that keeps me apart from you. Father, I pray that we would all come humbly. Help all of those of us who are followers of Jesus to come and acknowledge that our sin has been against you, against your holiness, against your justice, and your love. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Father, help us to see how the consequence of our sin has affected not only our relationship with you, but our relationship with each other. Help all of us here to confess and change those things which keep us apart from you and break apart our relationship with others. In your loving compassion, Father, have mercy and forgive us for sin. Help us to seek your grace for reconciliation, for a better way to do things. Father, through faith in you and by trusting in your son's death and resurrection, we have been redeemed. Father, thank you for what you have done, that we can come to you for mercy and for forgiveness. We can be filled with confidence, not because of what we have done, but because of what you have done. In your son's death and resurrection, Father, you have made a way for us to be clean, to be forgiven, to be whole. And Father, not just to be forgiven, but for healing and for restoration as well. So we come to you, Father, asking you for that. Your forgiveness can feel like a heaviness has been lifted from our hearts, from our lungs, from our chests, so that we can breathe again. Father, your love and your power is like the air that fills our lungs. Thank you, God, for the joy that that brings, that when we are forgiven, when we are reconciled with you, there is joy. Help us to know and feel that joy. And even when we don't feel full of joy, or we are feeling hopeless or sad or exhausted or confused, Father, I pray that you would fill us with your breath, with your hope, with your peace. Peace can be so hard to find right now in the world around us, in ourselves, in our families sometimes, in our workplaces. But God, I pray that your peace would fill us and that we would be able to share it with others. Father, we need you so much right now. We always need you. I pray that you would help us to come to you no matter what. Father, I ask you to help those in our congregation who are sick, who need your healing. I pray that they would feel your comfort and your presence even in their illness. I pray that you would help them to find whatever health care that they need, that you will help them to access it, that would be available to them, and that you would bring people into their lives who would help them with whatever it is that they need. Father, for those who are struggling with finances, I pray that you would fill that need, that they would be able to trust in you more. And Father, if any one of us are a way to meet the need of someone else, that you would help us to know that and to act on it, to obey you in sharing what we have with others. Father, I pray especially that you would be with teachers and students right now. It's such a hard time to be at school, whether you're online or in person. God, give the teachers from our family strength 
to get up every day and to continue to care for these kids. And Father, for the kids who are anxious and maybe not sleeping, I pray you would give them rest and sleep and energy for the next day. And for, for those who are feeling anxious or depressed, God, our mental health is a concern and particularly during this pandemic, God, it has made for some people it more difficult to deal with those things that are that are already really hard. And so God, I pray that you would intervene in the lives of those who are struggling, that you would help them to find you, Father, that people would come into their lives that they need, that, Father, they would find you and your peace um, in, in all of this in some way. And Father, I thank you for all the great things that you are doing, the way that needs have been met, the way people have been protected, the way that you are answering prayer all of the time. Thank you so much for how great you are. Thank you for the more minutes of sunshine every day that we are getting as, as the, the gloom of winter starts to disappear. Thank you, God, for the promise of spring. And I pray that you will be pas with Pastor Dennis this morning as he brings your word to us and that we would hear what you have to say to us through your word. Remind us this week, God, that you are full of never-ending love, of hope and joy. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church family and friends. I trust that you've had an amazing week, which has truly been blessed by God. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from the heavens above with wisdom and power and love. Our God truly is an awesome God. Is that not a fact? Amen to that. Can I hear an amen? Well, whenever we look at the religious landscape today that is known by the word Christianity, it seems clear that what we see is so different than what the Bible sees. We see multiple denominations that teach differently and at times contradictory things. Of course, when teachings contradict, we know that they cannot both be true. Either one of them, the two teaching, is correct biblically, or they're both wrong. The question then is, which church is right? I thought I would start our day off with the church bulletin messages that someone forgot to vet prior to print. So I hope this gets you smiling. So here we go. Number one. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things not worth keeping around your house. Bring your husbands. Number two. This evening at 7 p.m. there will be a hymn singing in the park across from the church. Bring a blanket and come prepared to sin. Oh, gosh. All right, number three. Podluck Supper, Sunday at 5 p.m. Prayer and medication to follow. <laughs> Next one. The sermon this morning. Jesus walks on the water. The sermon tonight. Searching for Jesus. Here's number five. At the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is hell? Come out early and listen to our choir practice. And lastly, don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. <laughs> Let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for this amazing day that we are able to gather together in your name. We can't gather corporately in the church, but we truly are uh, listening to your message in our, in our comforts of our homes and uh, wherever we may be. Lord, I just want to uh, ask that your spirit will guide me, give me uh, the strength through the words, uh, your word, uh, to be able to deliver this message, to edify people and to guide people and to, uh, and to strengthen them, to deliver, uh, deliver this message out to others that do not know you. Lord, continue to be with us, continue to, uh, to encourage us, and Lord, we just, uh, we just want to give you the thanks and the honor and glory. Uh, through this beautiful day. Pray this in your glorious name. Amen. So a man, he, he bought a hunting dog and he was eager to see how he performed. He took him out to track a bear. No sooner had they gotten into the woods than the dog picked up the trail. Suddenly, he stopped. He sniffed the ground and he headed uh, in a new direction. The inexperienced dog had caught the scent of a deer that had crossed the bear's path. A few moments later, the dog halted again, this time smelling a rabbit that had crossed the path of the deer. 
and so on and so on it went until finally the breathless hunter caught up with his dog only to find him barking triumphantly down the hole of a field mouse. Well, sometimes we as Christians and the church as a whole are like that. We start out with high resolve, keeping Christ first in our lives. We go and we plant churches to be the light and salt. But after a while, our time and our energy and our attention is diverted to things of lesser importance. Our pursuit leads to another until we've strayed far from the original purpose. Today I want to go back to the basics and talk about the purpose for the church. And as we start this month of March leading up to Easter, I want us to go back to the very basics and ask a simple but important question. What is the church to you? What is the church? I read one definition which says that the church is a group of people who find themselves in a new relationship with one another because of their new relationship with Jesus Christ. We do not go to church because we are the church. The church is God's creation and design. It is His method of providing spiritual nurture for believers and a community of faith through which the gospel is proclaimed and His will advanced in every generation. So I want us to open, open up our Bibles to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, and we're going to read verses 13 through 19. Scripture says, When Jesus came into the region of Caesar Philippi, he asked his, his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man am. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is the first mention of the church in the Bible. Jesus spoke of it here before it even came into existence on the day of Pentecost. The word church is the Greek word ecclesia, which comes from the verb kalio, which means to call. The church are the called out ones. The Greek term originally referred to an assembly of people who were called out from among the population to meet and to make decisions and to be instructed. This is what we are. We have been called out of the world into a community of faith. With the present situation where we can't gather in the church uh, building, we must be reminded of what the body of Christ, the church, is. The passages uh, describe the church in four ways. First, it's the foundation. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Jesus said to Simon Peter, On this rock I will build my church. Jesus did not say that he would build the church on Peter, on your rock. He said, I will build the church. It was not Peter's church. There are lots of jokes about Peter standing at the pearly gates, deciding uh, who goes in and out. And this is not the case. The church does not belong to Peter, and it doesn't belong to the pastor or the elders or the deacons. Jesus did not say he would build only the Baptist Church or the United Church or the Catholic Church. He said, I will build my church. The church is his. The church belongs to Jesus, my friends. The rock upon which the church is built is Christ himself. It's built upon the truth of Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God. Upon this confession, everything is based. If Jesus is Lord, then everything we do is for Him. Jesus is the center of the church, and we must be re reminded of this. In Colossians 1, verse 16, Scripture, well, Paul writes this, For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and for Him. And in Luke 6, verses 48 through 49, Scripture says, He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against the, the house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and it was, it was destroyed because it was complete. Faith is only as good as the faithfulness of what you believe in. The issue is not just believing, but the truth and faithfulness of what you believe in. The church is based upon the fact that Jesus is God. When a building is built to code, it usually has a, a secure foundation that will survive violent storms. Years ago at Niagara Falls, two men were in a boat and they found themselves caught in a current. The men jumped from the boat and they swam for the shore. And at the last minute, ropes from the shore were thrown out to them. The one man, he grabbed the rope and was pulled to shore. The other man grabbed a rope, but at the same time, at the same instant that rope came into his hand, a log he floated by him. The thoughtless and confused man, instead of seizing the rope, laid hold of the log. It was a fatal mistake. They were both in imminent danger, but the one was drawn to the shore because he had a connection to the land. The other, however, was clinging to the log, which was carried over the falls, and he was killed. Well, number two, the description of the church it's, is his function. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Scripture says. Jesus gave the church the keys to the kingdom. Well, what does this mean? A key provides access. You cannot get into a house or a car without a key. A key represents authority. So let me cite you an example. you got friends and family coming over to feed your cat when you were away. But you give them a house key to get in and out. Is that not correct? <clears throat> Jesus gave his church the authority to go into all the world to offer salvation and discipleship to all the people. That is the function of the church. In Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. The church is a storehouse of grace. It possesses the gospel, which is the good news of salvation. The church holds the key to eternal life is what I'm more or less saying. Jesus is the Lord of the church because He is the Savior of the church. When God, when God created human beings, they chose to either follow God or to turn away. And as a result, we were separated from God. But God did not give up. He sent His own Son in human flesh so that He would die for our sins on the cross. Jesus is not only the Creator, but He's also the so the Savior who died for our sins on the cross and the resurrection. This is called the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we were sinners, while we were enemies, while we were still helpless, 
Christ. Jesus Christ died for us. Ungodly, thus demonstrating the love of God. Yes, the Bible calls his death the good news because it shows how much God loves us. It's the good news because it not only shows how much God loves us, but how precious and how valuable we are to God. We were redeemed at the cost of His only Son. God paid His Son to redeem us because we are so precious and we are so valuable. Therefore, the Bible says, You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. So Paul confessed, The life I, li I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Jesus created us, but he also saved us. That's why we as the church confess Jesus as our Creator and our Savior. This is the mission that comes again to the church in every generation. We are the hands and feet of Jesus going out into all the world with the good news and seeing people enter into the saving relationship with Jesus, passing from death to life. The church in every generation has the responsibility to preach the gospel and win the lost and to train the disciples and heal the brokenhearted and to lift them up, those who have fallen. So here's a story on April 10th in 1912. The reportedly unsinkable ship, the Titanic, set sail from England with 2,240 people on board. More than 1,500 never made it to its destination. But there was a survivor by the name of Eva Hart, and she remembers the night, April 15, 1912, on which the Titanic sank some two hours and 40 minutes after an iceberg tore a 300-foot gash in the starboard side. She says, I saw all the horrors of the sinking. I heard even more dreadful the cries of drowning people. Although 20 lifeboats and rafts were launched, too few and only partly filled, most of all the passengers ended up struggling in the icy seas, while those in the boats waited a safe distance away. Lifeboat number 14 did roll back after the ship sank at 2.20 in the morning. Alone, it chased the cries in the darkness, seeking and saving the precious few. Incredibly, no other boat, no other lifeboat joined in. Some were already overloaded, but in disbelief, every other boat, those already saved, rowed their half-filled boats aimlessly in the night, listening to the cries of the lost, each feared a crush of unknown swimmers would cling to, cling to their craft and eventually swamping it. I came to seek and to save the lost, our Savior said. He came, Jesus Christ came, to seek and to save. And he commissioned us to do the same. But we face a lar large obstacle which is called fear. While people drown in the treacherous waters all around us, we are tempted to stay dry and to make certain that no one rocks the boat. In the point number three of the church description, it's the fruit. Whenever you bind, whatever you loose. Jesus not only given us the keys to the kingdom, but he has also given us the Holy Spirit to empower us to a victorious Christian living. In him, we have not only eternal life, but life abundant. In the name of Christ, we have been given the authority to take the spiritual resources of heaven and to apply them to the problems of this earth. We are to bind the powers that enslave people and loose them to live as Christ intended them to. One of my greatest joys as, as being a pastor is seeing how Jesus has, can transform lives, but I can personally account for how Jesus transformed my life. We all have a testimony to tell others, and I am touched when I hear how people were transformed, from which might be a castaways to seeing how merciful 
God has created anew into their lives. Let's go back to our Bible, Galatians 5. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the, spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Through the Holy Spirit we are transformed. Old habits and addictions are changed as our characters are aligned to Christ. We are changed and become different people. We have been set free in Christ and empowered to do the work that Jesus has given us to do. It is always amazing to see the power that is in the name of Jesus, especially when dealing with the demonic. Through the church, the fruit of the Spirit is released on earth, bringing healing and change and transformation as the kingdom of God breaks out. So the fourth point is his future of the church. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. The church is not a fortress, but a Christian army. The gospel is the, is the going out every day, and the more and more people are responding to it. Many people in the Western world are saddened by what they see as the shrinking church, but that's not true of the global church. You see, the kingdom of God is moving forward, and there is nothing in the world that can stop it. Absolutely nothing. Despite what we feel and what we see that is going on today, we still have the church, and the church is still God, and it is the kingdom of God, my friends. Notice that it says that the gates of hell will not overcome it. When was the last time you were chased by a gate? Has a door ever jumped off its hinge and ran after you? The passage assumes that is the church that is moving forward. Look at Matthew 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. The word here for forceful in Greek is the word baezo, which comes from the word bias, or life. Living things grow. The picture here is of a tree growing out through a crack in the concrete. You've probably seen that, where something grows out of a crack in a, in, a, in a sidewalk. It is forcing its way out. Some days the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. So let's look back in the Old Testament. Habakkuk 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the seas. We know from the end of the book, Revelation, what the outcome will be. We see that in the end, we will win. But until then, the church has work to do. Is that not correct? We know the end of the book, but, we, but there are chapters yet to be written. God has given us everything we need to fulfill our mission. We are His church. And we need to do that. We need to fulfill his mission. There's a lot of notable wealthy people on the Titanic in 1912, but the most notable passenger on the Titanic was someone that most of the world has never ever heard of. His name was, was uh, John Harper. He was a plain, ordinary pastor from the city of Glasgow in Scotland. He had faithfully shepherded his congregation for years and had just accepted the call to pastor a church Moody Church in Chicago. That's why he and his daughter were on the Titanic. Now it's told that the night the Titanic sunk, that John Harper put his daughter into one of the lifeboats and then started helping others to safety. He had given his life in helping people to find salvation, and that night was no different for him. That night, 1,528 people went into the frigid waters of the Atlantic. John Harper, he clung to a piece of the wreck and was frantically calling out to the people in the water, leading them to Jesus before they got hypothermia and died. Mr. Harper, he floated near one young man who had climbed up on a piece of debris. And he asked him before, between breaths, he says, young man, 
Are you saved? And the young man replied, No, I'm not. Well, Pastor Harper then cried out to him, Believe on the name of the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Well, a wave swept him away, and the young man was alone. Amazingly, a few minutes later, the waves brought John Harper back, and again he called out, Young man, are you saved yet? Well, the young man answered, No, I cannot honestly say that I am. Again he cried out, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Well, moments later, John Harper died of hypothermia, and he went under. The young man, alone in the water with no hope of being rescued, believed, and he gave his life to Christ. Of the 1,528 people that went into water that night, six were rescued by lifeboat number 14. And one of them was this young man who was floating on the debris. Years later, he gave his testimony of that night, saying with tears, he says, I am John Harper's last convert. This servant of God did what he had to do. While other people were trying to buy their way onto the lifeboats and selfishly trying to save their own lives, John Harper, he gave up his life so that others could be saved. He did it because he understands that this life was not the end, but only the beginning. He knew what was awaiting him. Jesus gave his life so that he may become his very own people, totally committed to doing good. This is our identity as the church, his very own people, totally committed to doing good. The fact that Jesus gave his life, that so that we may become his very own people, to totally committed to doing good, reveals that Jesus himself is totally committed to doing good. He is so committed to doing good that he will hold us, his people, accountable, whether we did good works or not. Look in your Bibles to Titus 2.14. Titus 2.14. Who gave himself, Jesus Christ, for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So I want us to think of the post-COVID church and the many ways the world culture has changed. What does this mean to the church? What does this mean to you personally is the question I want to ask. Again, look at Scripture, 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. My friends, we, we are a part of the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. The gates of Haiti will not overpower it. In Christ, we have life, my friends. Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in Jesus Christ will never die. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus died for you personally? Yes, you personally is the question I just asked. Do you believe that Jesus died for you personally? In a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating Easter. And presently, we're going through a time of reflection and prayer. Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church, for no one can lay any other foundation that has been laid down. That foundation, my friends, is Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen to that, my friends? Well, I just don't know about you, but I truly am blessed by, by God's word today to know that Jesus Christ is with us now and forever. So let's close in prayer. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> oh, Lord. Heavenly Father, we uh, again, we come to you uh, with such thanks and gratitude. We are... You are a holy and just Lord, a supreme God that hears our prayers and you know our hearts. We know that your ways and thoughts are far greater than ours. And, that, and with us, we need your prayer and strength, or power and strength, Lord, and ability to stay positive through this difficult time. Lord, fill us with your spirit of love and with your joy 
your wisdom, and with constant reminders that your presence will go with us. You will give us rest, Lord. Thank you that you came to give new life and peace and hope and joy to your children. Thank you, Lord, that your power is made perfect in our weakness. We know that you are with us and you fight for your people. We believe that it's not by might nor power, but by your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, that you make a difference in our world. We choose to trust you today and to recognize the authority of who you are in our lives. Help us not to follow after the voice of this world, but to press in close to you, Lord, to hear your whispers and to seek after you alone. We will declare that your love stands firm forever, for your love kindness endures forever, Lord. We pray for our church, Inniswood Baptist, and all the church family, that you will continue to keep us our spirits lifted up. Lord, that you will continue to place that hedge of protection around us all, and keeping us healthy, and keeping us extremely strong in our faith. Lord, we recognize that this church is your church, and we are your children. And we ask for your help to set aside our differences and to look to the greater cause, the cause of Jesus Christ. Please help us to truly live out a life of love. We know that this is the only possible through the power of your Spirit. So we ask that you move across our community in a miraculous way, with fresh filling and awareness, turning your people back to you, drawing others to come to know you, we need your unity and your love to stir our hearts and to give direction to our days. We need your wisdom, Lord, to guide us. And we need your spirit to lead us, to live out a godly life that would bring honor to you first. We thank you that you are always with us, Lord, and give us great purpose and hope. Lord, we continue to pray for all the ministries that are reaching out with your gospel. Lord, we also pray for all those who are dealing with with illnesses, and other troubling situations. You know all of our hearts, Lord. Guide us to make a difference in this world so that we reflect your peace and hope to a world that is so desperately needing your presence and healing. <clears throat> we give you the glory and honor for all that you're doing in our lives every day, Lord. Even in the times that we can't see it and understand your ways, shine your light in us and through us and over us, Lord. May this church make a difference in this world for your glory and for your purpose. May all your plans succeed through this church to reflect your peace and your hope. Lord, fill us with your power of your Holy Spirit this day and every day, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You are the head of this church providing us the blueprint in life. It is your gospel of righteousness that you have revealed that we will live by and your grace and mercy that you have given to us that we truly cherish. We stand before you today giving you all the honor, all the glory, Lord, and all the praise. In this we pray in Jesus' glorious name. Amen. Well, thank be to God, my friends. This has been another great day, and I, and I, and I thank you so much for, for joining in this church service. We truly do worship the most supreme God, the creator of all. And I just want you to be uplifted and knowing that Jesus Christ is with you. He is with you now forever. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Have an amazing week. And I truly do look forward to, to seeing you and, uh, and speaking again with you. But remember, stand firm on your faith. Stand in the rock, this true foundation of the church that Jesus Christ has made for us. We are the church. God bless each and every one of you.